In this video, we go through an introduction to simulation where we give some definitions initially, provide a couple of simulation examples, and then talk about the components of a simulation study. And so we're basically motivating the remainder of the video series uh, in talking about just what do we mean when we talk about uh, this notion of simulation. So starting out, I provide some references for the material that we use. Uh, first and foremost, we have the Simio and Simulation book, the third edition, that's the basis for this particular video series. In addition to that book, uh, we also uh, have some material from Simulation with Arena, the fifth edition, uh, the Simulation Modeling and Analysis, uh, the uh, Discrete Event Simulation 4th Edition, Stochastic Modeling, uh, the Wikipedia, and finally, uh, Introduction to Simulation uh, using Simon. These reference sources are all readily available, along with many, many other uh, references and um, uh, books and articles and so on, the general topic of uh, simulation. So let's start out talking about some definitional uh, material. First of all, I grabbed from Wikipedia, and the Wikipedia definition says simulation is the imitation of the operation of a real-world process or system over time. The act of simulating something first requires that the model be developed. This model represents the key characteristics or behaviors, functions of the selected physical or abstract system or process. The model represents the system itself, whereas the simulation represents the operation of the system over time. A couple other definitions that are related. Simulation refers to a broad collection of methods and applications to mimic the behavior of real systems, usually on a computer with appropriate software. The process of designing a model of a real system and conducting experiments with this model for the purpose of understanding the behavior of the system and are evaluating various strategies for the operation of the system. And then finally we have uh, one that says discrete event simulation consists of a collection of techniques that when applied to the study of a discrete event dynamical system generate sequences called sample paths that characterize the system's behavior. There's some common notions uh, among all of these definitions. First of all, we're creating a computer model of some type of system, generally a complex system, and then we're observing the model as it evolves over time. And so we're using the model to draw inferences about the system and then later performing experimentation in order to understand the operational characteristics and behaviors of the system that's being modeled. So before we detail any further, let's look at a couple of simulation examples. The first one we'll look at is a very simple queuing system where we have two servers in series. And so we see entities, or we can think of these as customers, uh, arrive and they are, are processed by server one and then they move uh, to server two or processed and then they depart. So this is a very common configuration that we see in many, many places in real life. So we can think of server one maybe, or our system maybe is modeling say a doctor's office where server one represents the receptionist and server two represents the doctor. We can think of it as fast food restaurant where server one uh, is the uh, wait staff and server two might be the kitchen that's cooking the food or something like that. Uh, and so it's a very common system that we see uh, over and over. And so in the notion of simulation, you can see that we've created a, a sample simulation model here. We have our server one and server two, and we can see that the as the model executes, we're actually creating uh, our customers. And so we have different colors here representing different customer types. And as the system runs, or as the system uh, executes over simulated time, we're observing uh, the system state. So in our little graph here, we're looking at the numbers of number of customers uh, in our system. And we have two different measurements. We have the golden colored measurement, which measures the instantaneous number of customers in the system. So at any point in time, the gold line tells me how many customers are there at that given time. And the green line represents the average number. And so we can see the average number as we would accept, expect stabilizes as uh, time increases. And so we can simultaneously observe the instantaneous number and the average number. And so again, the basic idea here uh, is to create our computer model that mimics the behavior of the system execute the model and watch that as it uh, evolves over simulated time. So our tandem queuing system is a fairly simplistic system. Our second example is a little bit more involved. And so in our second 
example we're modeling an airport and you can see uh, the airport we have uh, the arriving passengers and the passengers come through a check-in area where they can either uh, check in through the individual uh, kiosks which we see some kiosks here and some kiosks here or they can go to a uh, manual check-in uh, uh, that has a human. So the human uh, staff is over here. See the customers coming in and selecting where they want to uh, go through the check-in. They then go through an ID check. Uh, then they go through security scanners uh, here and then over um, here we see they're going to their uh, departing flights and so we have passengers that are queuing up uh, waiting to get on the plane. And so one thing you can immediately see here is that we have this nice three-dimensional model and so uh, in our model we can actually move around in three-dimensional space uh, and observe uh, the system as it behaves uh, as the real system would behave. And while the 3D model is uh, definitely pretty cool. Uh, we generally build simulation models to answer specific questions or to do specific analysis. In this model's case, we're interested in the uh, resource allocation. In particular, we're interested in the number of kiosks. So we have the check-in kiosks here and we have a second bank here. The number of uh, human check-in um, people, the number of uh, ID check stations, and the number of scanner stations and so clearly uh, if you've ever been to an airport you realize that we could increase the throughput of passengers if we simply increase our resources so if we have more check-in people or more check-in kiosks or more scanners or more id checks then the people can get through the system quicker of course all of those things cost money so allocating resources uh, to make the system run in the most effective manner uh, is a question that the airport management is particularly interested in. And that's uh, one of the main uses of, of simulation modeling. And so this model, the airport model, which we'll see a little bit later on in the series, uh, we can perform experimentation and you can just see a sample of that experimentation uh, right here. And so we see that we have over here in blue the four decisions that I mentioned earlier. In other words, how many check-in kiosks, how many check-in clerks, how many ID checks, and how many scanner stations. And we are checking on responses. In other words, we're uh, measuring the profit and cost. And so the profit and cost associated with a particular configuration. And so we've modeled the system where we uh, have a certain dollar amount for each one of our resources. We have a certain revenue amount based on customer throughput and customers not waiting and particular customers not missing their flights. And you can see that when we ran the experiment, we ran many, many different scenarios where we systematically altered our resource configuration. And then it, with respect to each one, the simulation then reported what the uh, responses or the results were for that particular configuration. And so based on our very simple run, we can see that the configuration that comes with the best revenue is uh, five check-in kiosks, five check-in clerks. So get everybody checked in quickly, a single ID check, uh, and two scanners. And so the basic idea is that if we've done everything correctly, since our model tells us with this configuration we would achieve this revenue, we're inferring that the real system would behave similarly. And so that because the model behaves this way and we've optimized the, the uh, resource configuration, that that would apply to the real system also. Of course, that makes many, many assumptions in particular about the correctness of our uh, modeling approach and experimentation and so on. And all of those are topics for the rest of the uh, simulation video series. While our first two examples are of systems that are representative of systems that we see in reality, our final example is an actual real system. And so what I have here is a video uh, of a model that was done for a large bottling warehouse. And you can see what's going on is we have these green uh, production lines which are producing pallets uh, of beverage. And we are tracking the pallet creation rate. So this is the rate at which pallets are created. We're tracking the number of pallets on hand. And so you can see in all of these, these brown lines represent lanes 
uh, of palettes. And so, in, for example, over in, uh, let's see, let me let it uh, stabilize for a second. We can see this is a lane of particular palettes. We see forklifts that are picking up the pallets and loading them on these trucks. And so we see a line of forklifts here that are currently idle. And we're basically modeling the creation of pallets, the storage of pallets in the warehouse floor, and the loading of pallets uh, on, on trucks. And so from an operational standpoint, we're trying to uh, measure the, pallet, the uh, warehouse utilization, making sure that we have uh, sufficient uh, pallet storage space, but not a lot of empty space. And we're also measuring how long trucks wait in the system. So when a truck arrives uh, to be loaded, uh, how long does it take for it to uh, get a forklift, get loaded, uh, and leave? And so you can see as uh, with, our, with our airport model, uh, it's a complete three-dimensional model. Now that we've moved uh, to 3D mode, you can actually see uh, what the pallets look like uh, in the lanes on the floor. And so the forklifts load pallets on uh, in the individual lane. Each lane has a different type of beverage, so a different stock keeping unit or, or what's called a SKU. And you can see the um, uh, you can see the forklifts moving around, uh, picking pallets from the production lines, uh, which we don't have 3D models for in this particular example, and then delivering those pallets to a uh, floor lane uh, or to an arriving truck. And so as with the airport model, previously the expectation is that the model is predicting the behavior performance that the actual system would see. So under the, the the uh, configuration that we've specified in our model, the actual system would uh, achieve these uh, same basic performance. So the company uh, for this model was interested in, in several different aspects. Uh, first of all, they were interested in the configuration of the warehouse. So how deep should the lanes be? How many lanes should we have? Uh, what should be the skew allocation to lanes? In other words, which skews do I put in which lanes? They were also interested in the pallet production sequence. So we're producing different items. So we want to produce those in a particular sequence. Uh, sequencing and scheduling uh, truck arrivals uh, and then truck uh, loading versus uh, stacking from the uh, from the production line. And so as with the airport model, we designed an experiment, or we designed in this case actually several different experiments to evaluate uh, these different configuration options and provide uh, the performance estimates um, uh, that we would expect the system would see. And so we can see that this system, the bottling warehouse, is quite a bit more complex than either of our two previous examples, the tandem queuing model or the airport model. So we have thousands of pallets that are moving uh, in our system at any one time, and we're tracking information about each one of those pallets. We have arriving trucks, we have production lines, and so on. So this highlights one of the benefits of simulation relative to many other analysis methodologies is that we can create models of arbitrarily complex systems and then perform the same type of analysis that we uh, do for simplistic models on those complex models. So when we think about the three examples that we just went through, uh, we have three different systems that we're interested in analyzing. So we had our tandem queuing system, we had our airport, and we have our modeling warehouse. And we'd like to be able to analyze system performance and make decisions about how to configure the system uh, and so on. And so we basically have a couple of options here uh, for analyzing these types of systems. First of all, we could experiment with the actual system. So in the case of our airport, we could systematically increase or decrease the number of check-in agents and evaluate the performance. Or with our bottling warehouse, we could uh, increase or decrease the number of forklifts or change the floor configuration uh, month by month and um, uh, observe the, the, the corresponding performance. Of course, in many cases, this is expensive, uh, time-consuming, and quite difficult. And so instead of experimenting with the actual system, we'd like to create a model. So instead of exercising our airport in an actual airport, let's create a model of the airport. Within this notion of a model, we can have physical models and we can have mathematical models. So physical models certainly have their place. Uh, architects use physical models to show spatial relationships to clients and, uh, and amongst themselves. Uh, aerospace engineers use physical models of airplane wings and other um, 
uh, missiles and so on uh, in uh, wind tunnels to check the aero, uh, aerodynamic, uh, aerodynamic uh, characteristics of systems and so on. We also have mathematical models uh, where we represent the system through a set of mathematical equations or a computer model that behaves as the system would behave. Within this category of mathematical models, we have analytical models and we have simulation. Of course, our interest here uh, in this course, in this video series, is in the application of simulation. And so what we will look at is our modeling of systems to predict performance and then to then uh, draw conclusions and use the model to, uh, to make uh, configuration decisions about the underlying system. For this course and the video series, many of the systems that we're interested in modeling can be represented as queuing systems. In a queuing system, we have a service provider that has finite capacity. We have arriving customers, we have departing customers. So customers arrive, they receive service, and they depart. And if a customer arrives and the service provider is busy, the customers wait in line. And so we see examples of queuing systems in everyday life all the time. In fact, all three examples that we went that uh, we did previously are examples of queuing networks, where rather than having a single uh, queue uh, service provider, we have these in a network configuration. So in our tandem configuration, we had two in series. In our airport model, we had arriving customers could select which uh, check-in kiosk or which check-in system they went to and they went to the ID station and so on. In our bottling warehouse uh, we had entities that were created from the production lines. They then are taken by forklift to floor stacks and so on. And so we represent uh, complex systems using these types of queuing networks. And in these types of systems, we're interested in several different performance metrics. In general, just a couple of standard ones. We're interested in the time customers spend in the system. So from the time of arrival till the time of departure. We're interested in how long customers wait for service. We're interested in the number of customers in the system, the number of customers in queue. And we're interested in uh, the server utilization. As we combine these queuing systems into queuing networks, there will be other performance metrics that we're interested in, but these are the, the fundamental metrics that we're almost always interested in. In addition, we're interested in looking at alternative configurations. So as a quick example, let's just think about having a queuing system where I have three servers. So I might think about a fast food restaurant where I have three workers. And my decision is, how do I configure my system? And so we have three basic options here. Uh, that I that I have illustrated here. Uh, the first one is where I have three servers, each with its own queue. So we think about a, an arriving customer opens the door, immediately chooses which queue to get in, and then uh, uh, is served by that given server. Similarly, we can have three servers with a single queue. And so we have customers that arrive, they get in a single line, and when you reach the front of the line, you go to the next uh, server that becomes available. We also can have three servers in series. So we can sort of think about this in terms of having a particular amount of work that each server has to do. And in the two uh, parallel configurations, the servers do everything. So server one, server two, server three all do the entire task. Whereas in the series configuration, you would divide the task up. So in this case, ideally, we would divide the task into thirds. So S1 does one third, S2 does one third, and S3 does one third. And we see examples of these uh, in the real world all the time. In fact, in the domain of fast food restaurants, I'm sure you all uh, can name examples where we have the uh, individual servers with individual queues, individual servers with a common queue, and the series configuration uh, in various systems. So the question then becomes, well, how do we decide between these? So if I'm designing a system or uh, I'm op or modifying a system, how do I decide which configuration to use? In addition, how do I decide how many servers I need and so on? And so that's really where simulation and analysis come into play. The simula simulation methodology here would be, let's create a simulation model with each configuration. Let's execute the model and let's observe the system behavior and then analyze this, the uh, performance metrics for each configuration so that I can select between those. 
So more formally, we're doing something called sample path analysis when we do that, where a sample path is a record of the time-dependent behavior of the system. So as the simulation executes, we're, uh, as I said before, watching the system evolve over time, and so we're tracking that information, creating what's called a sample path. We then analyze that sample path to try to extract information and predict performance. So I would create a sample path associated with our three server sing, uh, individual queue, create a sample path with our three server uh, single queue, create a sample path with our three server in series, and for each one of those sample paths I would then uh, uh, analyze the performance metrics for the corresponding system. Of course, because most systems exhibit some type of random behavior, it's a little bit more complex than that. Instead of generating individual sample paths, I'm generating sets of sample paths. And we'll certainly see how to do that uh, as we move forward. But conceptually, what we're doing is we're systematically altering either the inputs or the logic and then looking at the corresponding effect uh, on the system performance. The basic simulation process that we follow is shown in the flowchart here, where we have four basic components. We have conceptual design, input analysis, uh, model development, verification, and validation, and finally output analysis and experimentation. As we can see here also, there's not a single linear flow. So we can go from conceptual design to input analysis, model development, back and forth, and so on. So you can basically move around uh, through these basic components uh, in a multitude of ways and in most simulation projects uh, you'll do that. You go back and start over. So we do some output analysis. We then go back and say well I need to modify uh, the concept because the model's not giving me what I want. Or during validation I run into a problem that dictates I go back and do some additional input analysis or some additional data collection because I, I can't properly validate my model. Or during experimentation, I determine that one or more of the inputs are critical, and so I'd like to be more certain about those inputs. And so I go back and do input analysis, some additional input analysis. And so you can see that that we have these, although we have these four basic components, we do these in a, in a, in a variety of sequences uh, and we uh, iterate through uh, these many times. Two things that are not shown in our process here but are described in detail in chapter one of the textbook uh, are the setting of project objectives and the development of a functional specification. So the project objectives define what it is you're trying to measure. So you don't generally do simulation models just for the sake of doing modeling. You're trying to answer a question or you're trying to answer a series of questions and so setting the objectives uh, is something that's absolutely critical prior to conceptual design. Similarly, a functional specification is in essence the contract between the stakeholder and the model developer. In other words, what is it that you're going to do? What are the expectations for uh, the results uh, and so on? And so that concludes the introductory material uh, for the video series. And next we'll start talking about basic simulation uh, technology and types of simulation models. And then we'll uh, jump right in to discussing these four basic components uh, for doing simulation modeling and analysis.